Oral questions by members? Member for Prince George Wilmont. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Life has never been more expensive than today under this NDP Premier. But instead of providing relief from sky-high housing costs, gas and groceries, the Premier is set to make everything more expensive. The NDP's so-called Clean BC scheme is a complete failure on emissions and an economic disaster that will see average household incomes plummet by $11,000 every single year. Why is the Premier recklessly pursuing failed policies that will hammer British Columbia's families who are already bearing the brunt of the NDP's cost of living crisis? Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. On the contrary, our government has taken a long list of measures to reduce costs for British Columbians, including an expanded climate action tax credit for low and middle income families. At the same time, Honourable Speaker, we have gone out of our way to take concrete measures that British Columbians expect as they face the horrors of out of control wildfires, heat domes, droughts, flooding. They understand they need measures that will help them react to those emergencies, while at the same time they expect our government to have a plan to reduce emissions. And contrary to what the member claims, that's exactly what our plan has done since 2017. It's reduced emissions, not only on a per capita basis while our population has expanded greatly, it has reduced them in absolute terms after years of rising emissions under that party when they were on this side of the House. Member for Prince George Wilmore Supplemental. Well, thank you, and maybe I should remind the Minister what one of his uh, group of allies had to say about emissions. In fact, they're going up, and he knows it. Here's what the Sierra Club had to say, and I quote, BC's emissions remain stubbornly high. That is a huge and growing concern, end quote. And yet this Premier continues to, pr to pursue a failed scheme. What's it going to do? It's going to kill jobs, paychecks, and investment, and it is going to rip billions of dollars of funding out of health care and essential services funding every single year. This NDP scheme is not just failing on emissions, but it is going to hammer working families in our province. So to the Premier, why is he stubbornly clinging to a failing strategy that not only misses the emission targets, but devastates families' incomes and funding for health care and other critical services? Minister. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Our plan is working. Our plan will continue. Our plan will deliver what British Columbians want, which is reduced emissions, which is exactly what the party opposite failed to do when they were in government. And that is exactly why. That is exactly why. Members, members, members. That's exactly why reducing emissions is a huge and immediate need for British Columbians. We have seen significant investments in clean technology in British Columbia. We just recently, last week, saw a significant investment in a lithium-ion battery plant to be built in Maple Ridge to create 400, over 400 new jobs. We've recently reached members, an agreement with the Fort members, McLeod. Members, members will be quiet. Minister will continue. Thank you very much. It's unfortunate that the opposition is more interested in uh, their own mythology than actually tackling climate change. <laughs> We've reached an agreement with the Fort McLeod First Nation that will see us work toward a very significant investment in clean hydrogen and a straddle plant. Honourable Speaker, costs for British Columbians have gone down under this government. A family with two kids earning $100,000 
I'm sorry that the facts hurt the opposition, Honourable Speaker. Members, members, with two kids. Members, members, come to order. And members, they don't want to hear it, Honourable Speaker. Members, because British Columbians Minister will know conclude. that a family with two kids earning $100,000 pays 34 percent less provincial taxes today than they did in 2016. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. That has to be one of the most out-of-touch responses we have heard, given how unaffordable, how unaffordable people are finding life in British Columbia right now. And, and the minister might want to brush off what the environmental groups are saying. But here's another quote. The government has failed to show us how it will meet its climate targets and has broken its own laws in the process. That's from EcoJustice. These are all supposed to be allies of this minister, and even they acknowledge that Clean BC is failing. And under this NDP Premier, we now have a record-breaking inflationary deficit of $6.7 billion and a doubling of the debt. But their failing so-called Clean BC scheme, by their own documents, has shown will plunge BC straight into a recession, cutting billions from government revenue and setting to kill off tens of thousands of private sector jobs by 2030. 20,000 jobs gone in transportation, Mr. Speaker, over 10,000 jobs gone in natural resource industries, and another 17,500 jobs in construction, all from government documents. How can this Premier stand by a scheme that will tank our economy and wipe out tens of thousands of jobs? Premier. Honourable Speaker. I know that the other side of the House is desperate to justify their about face on climate action. Yeah. Yeah. It's embarrassing. Their leader said that bringing in the carbon tax was one of the proudest things he ever did. And now they say, no, no, we don't think it's a good idea anymore. They will say anything to get elected. They are in a position of desperation, but I can't let them make up their own facts, Honourable Speaker. BC is an economic and fiscal leader in British Columbia. Our debt to GDP is less than half of Ontario and Quebec. We have the highest credit rating among provinces. Last year, we eliminated the operating debt. Now, we created more than 40,000 jobs already this year, more than 50,000 last year. When they were in government in 2012, when the leader of the opposition was the finance minister, they issued a press release when they created 17,000 jobs, yeah. Yeah. Honourable Speaker. Yeah. We're creating more jobs. We're cl creating clean jobs. We're taking climate action. But people are struggling with members, affordability. And members. that's why we've taken action to support them too. Lower ICBC rates, free, con uh, free uh, contraception, uh, affordability credits for families. And we're going to keep taking that action to support families on one of the biggest issues that they face, the cost of housing, which the opposition votes against every single action we're trying to take to provide affordable housing. How dare they stand up and say they're in favour of affordability? Give me a break. Kamloops North Thompson Supplemental. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Highest rents in Canada, highest housing prices in Canada, inflation that's outstripped the Canadian average 10 of the last 15 months. Should I continue on? Oh, and we keep getting ranked as the most unaffordable province in, in Canada. That's this Premier's record. But back to the failing Clean BC scheme, where we're not seeing emissions drop. And in fact, here's another quote. Clean BC is in many ways a Jetson's vision of the future. Now that's from Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. Mr. Speaker, the so-called Clean BC scheme has turned into a giant propaganda campaign and nothing more by this province. And in fact, all you have to do is watch a Canucks game where they see running non-stop high-cost ads extolling the virtues of Clean BC while failing to admit that emissions are failing under Clean BC. It's making less life less affordable, Mr. Speaker. The scheme is projected to cut household incomes by 11 thousand dollars a year based on this government's own documents and our economy backed by a decade it will strip billions annually 
from things like healthcare and education. On top of that, it's dealing a massive hit to the job market, with nearly tens of thousands of private sector jobs expected to disappear by 2030. Again, why is the Premier so sent on burdening families with higher costs and less income during already severe affordability crisis? Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's unfortunate that the member opposite forgets that it was his party that introduced the carbon tax in one of the few good things I would ever give the former Liberal government credit for. But they've now turned their back on it. Shall we continue? <laughs> Minister will continue. Minister, Mr. Uh, Speaker, the opposition can create all the mythologies they want. The fact is that emissions have dropped in actual terms and on a per capita basis since 2017, and they went up between 2007 and 2016 members, when they members, were on this please. side of the House. That, Honourable Speaker, is a fact, and they can't change it no matter what they say. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Ministry of Children and Family child protection workers have more power than CSIS, yet there is no regulation or independent oversight of the profession. MCFD social workers have the authority to conduct risk assessments, enter homes. They have the power to remove children. Some MCFD staff wielding such considerable power may not even have formal social work training. The Social Workers Act provides a comprehensive framework for the oversight of social work, and yet this minister exempts her entire ministry from being accountable to it. My question through you is to the Premier. Will he commit to immediately subjecting MCFD social workers to regulation under the College of Social Workers to ensure proper oversight and accountability? Government House Leader. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. Uh, we want to make sure that every child has access to the services and supports they need to live a full and healthy life. I appreciate the member's question, and I'll have to take it on notice. Member. Honourable Speaker, my question was to the Premier. Without the regulation of MCFD staff practicing social work, the Minister is undermining public trust. The representative of children and youth publishes reports. The Legislative Assembly accepts the recommendations, and yet we are still seeing the same heartbreaking results year over year. The Ministry and the people that work in it need effective oversight and regulation. First Nations Leadership Council, the BC Association of Social Workers, the representative for children and youth have called for the regulation of Ministry of Children and Family Social Workers. Despite this, there has been resistance through you to the Premier. Premier. Given the relentless instances of this ministry failing to protect children and families, will he insist that this government takes the long overdue step and commit to the most basic level of oversight and regulation of social workers? Thank you, Member. The question was taken on, to, on order, so we'll continue with that. Next member, House Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this NDP government is undertaking an initiative called Unlearning and Undoing White Supremacy and Racism in the Office of the Provincial Health Officer. Mr. Speaker, if there is racism and white supremacy occurring in the office of the Provincial Health Officer, British Columbians deserve to know the precise details of the exact, the exact incidents which have occurred. If this is once again the NDP Premier choosing to prioritize his woke politics over the real concerns of everyday hardworking people, I would ask that he stop wasting tax dollars taken from British Columbians to fund the BC NDP's virtual signalling. Mr. Pre virtue signalling, thank you. Mr. 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 Speaker, my question to the Premier, will this Premier please explain 
to British Columbians why this NDP government is claiming that, and I quote, white supremacist policies and practices remain hardwired into our systems and processes, unquote, after six very long years of NDP government. Minister of Health. Um, Honourable Speaker, uh, the member will know that um, at, in the first year of the pandemic, the government undertook in health care a, uh, a report that I think was an exceptional report and gave direction, Honourable Speaker, to where we need to go, where we are and where we need to go in the future in dealing with racism in the health care system. What that report excluded, uh, what that report um, demonstrated, both in the stories that it told and in the data that it provided, that racism, where it exists in health care, is damaging to people's health. We are taking comprehensive actions, supported, I thought, by all members of the legislature, to address this question, Honourable Speaker, which is fundamental to the success of a health care system. It means that every part of our health care system, every part of our health care system, has to take action against racism everywhere. Honourable Speaker, one of the details that that report provided was that Indigenous women were nine times more likely to leave against doctors' advice a major hospital in BC. And I would say uh, what that tells you is that racism is bad for their health and bad for our health. And we're going to take every step we can, united in this province, I believe, to act against racism wherever it's found and wherever it is. Yes. House Leader of the Fourth Party Supplemental. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have a supplemental question on the Office of British Columbia's Provincial Health Officer. Dr. Perry Kendall, BC's former Provincial Health Officer, used his office to help pave the way for the NDP's failed safe supply policy. He is now the founder of a company called Fair Price Pharma that peddles so-called safe drugs which are being sold on the streets and in our schools, creating a new generation of addicts. The Vancouver Sun, Mr. Speaker, reported in 2021 that Dr. Kendall's company had 15 kilograms of dillies. These are brutally addictive killer drugs sitting in steel drums and that, Mr. Speaker, is enough drugs to kill tens of thousands of kids. It may not be criminal, but it certainly feels like it should be. The question to this NDP Premier, is it ethical for government to buy safe supply drugs from a company started by the former provincial health officer of BC who used this mantle of his office to, put, to push to get these addictive drugs legalized? Yes or no? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Well, Honourable Speaker, I um, would say that uh, the work of the formal provincial health officer, Dr. Kendall, uh, has been exemplary in calling to attention in this province, calling the declaration of a public health emergency that now, in its seventh year, has killed over 13,000 British Columbians. We work closely and rely on the advice, the expertise of our public health officials to guide our response, and in this case, it's a response to one of the most vexatious public health issues that we could have uh, possibly uh, imagined in our province. So we are very grateful for all of the work that's done by frontline providers, doc the doctors, the nurses, the peer workers, the outreach workers, the public health officials who are helping to guide and provide the evidence for our evidence-based approach to how we deal with this issue. Um, I, I would say, uh, Honourable Speaker, that, um, <laughs> and point out as well, that uh, in, in, in case it's not uh, un well understood by the member, um, there are many, uh, there is much work happening across our healthcare system by healthcare providers to find innovative ways to try to save people's lives. The objective of our government 
The objective of our health care system, the objective of doctors, is to try to save people's lives, to keep them alive so that we can connect them to care and treatment. And that is why, as I understand it, Dr. Dr. Kendall started a not-for-profit company to try and contribute to that effort. So we're very grateful for the work that our public health officers do in this regard. Member for uh, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With half of the families just $200 away from being able to pay their bills at the end of the month, every dollar is crucial. Yet under the NDP's Clean BC scheme, these families are facing a staggering $11,000 cut in their household incomes every year. That's a direct blow to those hanging on and just furthering the NDP's middle class squeeze. So how can the Premier stand by a policy that only, has not only failed on emissions, but also threatens to push already vulnerable families over the edge in this deep affordability crisis. Minister of Environment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Commentators from around North America and, in fact, overseas point to Clean BC as one of the leading climate plans in North America, and it is achieving results, not just results in emission reduction, but results in spurring growth in low-carbon economic development, which is where the world is headed. The BCBC report assumes that climate action stopped in 2017, which, frankly, it would have were the people opposite still on this side of the House. Instead, we brought in a comprehensive plan that is helping industries in BC decarbonize and through our carbon tax, climate action tax rebates, we are assisting low and middle income families in a way the opposition never did when they were on this side of the House. Member for Surrey White Rock Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Minister of Environment speaks about experts. Well, those experts are actually pointing to BC as one of the most unaffordable places in North America. Nearly 60% more families, and that includes 62,000 children a month, depend on the food bank. That is a clear sign of an affordability crisis. That is a clear sign of a government failing on their commitments to affordability. And yet, amid this struggle, the NDP's Clean BC scheme will slash household incomes by $11,000 every single year. How can the Premier justify sticking to this scheme when families are lining up at the food bank more now than ever. Government House Leader. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. And uh, we know it's a tough time for many families in British Columbia. The member mentions the uh, affordability crisis, and of course, the member knows that it's often linked to housing. Uh, the fact that we have a growing population, the fact that our housing has not simply kept up with the amount of uh, units or homes that we need to ensure that people can have that level of affordability. That's why this session in particular, we introduced a whole host of legislation to enable more housing to be built, legalizing housing in this British, in the province, Honourable Speaker. So although I appreciate the member's question about affordability, I ask him, why haven't they supported any measures that we've brought forward for housing? Why haven't they provided any solutions to the problem, Honourable Speaker? They have not provided a single thing. Members, members, please. Honourable Speaker, Con conclude. If, if they truly care about the issue of road affordability, they will join us in, in, in taking initiatives forward that will help address the housing crisis, which is what's challenging most British Columbians in BC. Member for Kelowna Mission. Thank you much, Honourable Speaker. Well, uh, you know, the only thing that this NDP government is creating is housing chaos. In that tidal wave of rising living costs, the NDP solutions for people is like handing out teaspoons to bail. Catherine, a constituent and a pensioner of mine, embodies the struggle many face under the NDP's middle class squeeze. She and her husband, like so many others, have drastically cut back, limiting dining out, taking a car off the road, and focusing on essential groceries only. Yet even with this careful budgeting, they're significantly impacted by the carbon tax and added $143 on their essential home heating bill, which has doubled under this NDP government. And to double down at the NDP convention this weekend, the Premier announced that despite every other Premier and the federal NDP leader calling for carbon tax relief on home heating, he would not be. 
How can the Premier ignore the struggles of pensioners like Catherine and deny people a break on home heating? Premier. Thanks, uh, thanks, Honourable Speaker. The member stands up. She comes from a community that um, almost burned down this summer in a, in a wild uh, wildfire. Uh, only thanks to the remarkable work of the BC Wildfire Service and municipal forces from across, across the province that came to fight what everybody agrees was a climate-related disaster. The whole city burned down in this province. We're in year four of a drought. Cowichan River's drying up. Farmers are struggling. And, and all we see is the other side fighting action on climate change. Listen, we need to take, we need to take a leadership role in fighting climate change. And we need to protect Member. British Columbians. Why do they not support free heat pumps for British Columbians that have to use incredibly expensive fuel oil? Why, why are they fighting? Why don't they join us in calling Members. on the federal government Members. to provide the same benefits to British Columbians that Members. people in Atlantic Canada get? Take it easy, members. Easy. Member. Members. People in BC are entitled to the same benefits as the people in Atlantic Canada. I'd love for the other side to stand up for all those families that can't afford to switch, that have to fill up that fuel tank and can barely afford it. You know, they failed to take action on affordability when they were on this side of the house. They raised MSP rates. They put tolls on bridges. Uh, they child member, care. Member, child care was unaffordable. It's okay and, to listen to the answer, that please. Very it's member, okay. That very member was on a UDI panel where she said that the secret sauce of developers in her area, like her, was restricting the supply of housing. That's what she Members. said the secret sauce of developers like her was in her area. So if there's not enough housing in Kelowna, then she should look in the mirror, Honourable Speaker. Members, it's Members, it's okay to ask question and also okay to listen to the answer, please. Okay? Member for Caribou Chill Corton. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. What's frustrating is that the Premier forgets daily in this legislature that we are now living in the most unaffordable jurisdiction in Canada, frankly, in North America. And shockingly, Mr. Speaker, it could get so much worse under the NDP government. Respected economists Jock Finlayson and Ken Peacock have exposed the stark reality of the Clean BC scheme, and it's an outright economic disaster. They warn it will drag BC into what they describe, and I quote, as a long period of recession-like conditions, end quote. Particularly hard hit will be the resource sectors which are anticipating to shrink by nearly 20%. Mr. Speaker, how can the Premier support a scheme that's poised to destroy our economy, eliminate jobs, and reduce incomes all while putting essential services like health care at risk? Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I don't know why the opposition continues to ignore the facts that have been repeated to them, not just by me, but by respected economic analysts who have published in business in Vancouver. The fact is that the Business Council plan assumed that there would be no development in a clean economy Member. and no economic development uh, on uh, clean energy and clean technologies and expansion of resource industries to provide decarbonized economies. These are all important. The, the figure that they are quoting has been pointed out to be out of context. And as for costs, Honourable Speaker, this from a member of a party that raised ICBC rates, that raised BC Hydro rates, that raised MSP premiums, and that cut services to British Columbians on which they relied. We've eliminated MSP premiums. We took tolls off bridges. We took uh, ICBC rates down by a significant amount for every family in British Columbia, and they opposed us at every turn. Opposition House Leader. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the bottom line is this. Uh, seven years in a row under this government, this government has not met a single emissions reduction target. Zero. Not one. In fact, the emissions have been going up year after year after year. In 2021, that's the latest year 
that this government will even make its emission uh, numbers known to the public, which tells you a heck of a lot. What about the last couple of years uh, to the minister? Instead, we've got, the, we've got this glossy uh, Clean BC uh, document, this scheme, which is really nothing more than a, a glossy brochure. It's a great bumper sticker and a great marketing slogan that really is just intended to cover up a mishmash of regulations and taxes that have made British Columbia the least affordable jurisdiction in North America. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the NDP's so-called uh, Clean BC scheme, uh, on a go-forward basis, is a direct threat to the well-being of British Columbians. Uh, as we have been canvassing here in the official opposition today, it's projected to carve nearly $3 billion annually out of health care. It's set to reduce household incomes by $11,000 per family per year. And it will result in the loss of thousands of private sector jobs in British Columbia. So again, to the Premier, why is the Premier bent on pursuing a policy this clean BC scheme that's just going to destroy thousands of private sector jobs, reduce inc incomes, and undermine the essential services that British Columbians rely upon in this province. Premier. Honourable Speaker, uh, we added 47,300 jobs so far this year. <laughs> just last month, just last month, just last month, we added 6,600 private sector jobs. Our GDP, our GDP growth since 2017 is the highest in Canada among large provinces. Last year, 62,900 jobs year to year. People's wages in BC, and I know the member opposes it because I heard him in the media, are now the highest in Canada, Honourable Speaker. The last time BC was number one in wages was 19 years ago, Honourable Speaker. And now, Honourable Speaker, we're not satisfied we're not satisfied, Honourable Speaker. We're not satisfied with reducing child care costs alone, Mem with reducing members. ICBC rates, members. with free prescription contraception, with free, uh, free meal programs for, for kids that are hungry at school, with affordability credits as much as $1,200 for a family, with a higher BC family benefit. Honourable Speaker, those members have seen us deliver for British Columbians and we will continue to take action because we know families are struggling, and in particular on the issue of housing. And, Honourable Speaker, I look forward to when those members are called to account on the floor of this House for voting against every single housing affordi affordability initiative we're bringing forward as they stand up for investors and speculators and Member? people who turn homes into hotels. Members. What an embarrassment, Honourable Speaker. We're going to stand up for people every time on housing affordability, the cost of living, and they're going to do the same thing if they ever get the chance to get on this side again. The bell ends the question period.